Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Guys, I know it's uh, quarter to uh, nine and uh, people got biryani in the mind. Um, that's what we have, right? Biryani, right? So, alhamdulillah, um, it's going to be an interesting task because, um, how do you explain this? It's the analogy of fitting an ocean into a teacup. Because uh, my talk was something in the region of 45 minutes, but I'm going to try to keep it within 20 minutes and 25 minutes because of the overall schedule. This is my daughter. Sumaya, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I can't babysit the talk at the same time, sorry about that. Okay, this is the Quran of Him, Muhammad Abu 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 and uh, no doubt, you know, food for the bellies is on the mind, uh, but inshallah this session will be food for the soul. Um, inspiration from the Sahabas, wow, what can I say? Um, instead, if I could possibly turn it around and say, it's better to, uh, let's focus on the next 20 minutes on this concept of aspiring to inspire. If you can understand this concept, inshallah, it's aspiring to inspire. Inspiration is something, actually in its real essence, is something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The inspiration that comes from man to man, that's not everlasting. And there's no valid by it. The inspiration from, say, me tonight to you, or you from you tonight to me, um, it's not everlasting, it's temporary, it rubs up. But the inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ilham, is everlasting. And the barakah in that ilham, in that blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to few of us, few blessed few of us, that is priceless and valuable. And Muslims today, alhamdulillah, brothers and sisters, we owe immense, enormous debt to the founder, to the source of this deen, and that's Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and to his companions, because none of us here have seen the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, none of us have met him, not, have, not have spoken to him, but we know him through his actions, through his teachings, through the channel of the Sahaba as Men and women. Allah With respect to brothers and sisters, if I could just pick two, and this is not planned, if I could just pick two off the top of my head, two Sahabas, and the sacrifices and the lessons of their lives, which will be an inspiration for us today, 1432 years later. Okay? One is probably, arguably, the greatest muhaddith this ummah has ever produced. Anybody know the name? Anybody? Any guesses? Anis? Is it Anis bin Malik? Or is it not? Abu Huraira. This side? Sisters? Sorry? You know what's coming from this side? Aisha. <laughs> of course. Of course. I'll come to that. Yes. Okay. So Abu Huraira. Aisha Raghulam, no doubt, and it's been Malik, right? Abdullah bin Umar, radiallahu anhu, they you know, all in the top narrations, but no doubt it's going to be Abu Huraira, with 5,783, 84, I think something in the region of 5,800 hadith that he's narrated from Rasulullah so some that he's heard. Many and many and many of his own sahih. 800 of the companions have narrated this from Abu Huraira. And just to make, make a point of that, Abu Huraira the Ulama, why is an inspiration for us today and hampers of people of knowledge, people of academia? Well, he didn't spend 20 years with Rasulullah like, Umar, uh, like Abu Bakr Siddiq Radiallahu spent almost something the reason 20 years in the company of Rasulullah and Sayyidina uh, uh, Abu, Abu Huraira Radiallahu Anhu spent no more than 4 years, in some narrations 3, in others 4. In four years, he narrated number of a hundred more than Sayyidina Abu Bakr. And that is the key to gain knowledge, which inshallah by conveying it back to you guys, learning from the shayukhs and transmitting it through to you. On this very campus, your years on campus, will inshallah be a means of salafa, means of a blessing, a rahmah, and inshallah success not only in this life, but also in the akhirah. Brothers and sisters, 
Before I go into the second Sahaba, the second companion, I just wanted to say that every second we can sit here with this intention, inshallah, every second. Time is so important and we've lost a lot tonight. Time is so important. I can only say, share this with you the way I share my life. My wife is a testimony to that. Every second in our life is either a means of gaining Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure and gaining leanness to Him. If that second is wasted, it's a step towards uh, away from Him. This is the way I live my life. This is the way I've seen some of the great shayuts in the subcontinent in, in the uh, Middle East. This is how they live their life. Time is so valuable, they would not waste it. The people of Ihsan, the Muqsin, amongst us, the people of great spiritual excellence, they are very greedy over that one second. So, due respect to brothers and sisters, if you look at the life of Abu Huraira, the first lesson to take from his life, in the space of four years, he couldn't have done it with his human capabilities. That was the dua of Rasulullah for him in gaining that knowledge in that short space of time. But somebody asked him, Abu Huraira, how is it that you know so much? And Abu Huraira, he said, I live opposite Rasulullah you know, he's part of the uh, the Ahmed Sufa, the people of the bench, which had a special place in the masjid. So he used to live uh, very near to the Prophet He said, when the door of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam opens, Abu Huraira rises. My day starts from the door, opening of the door of Rasulullah When I see his door open, that's when my knowledge starts. I sit very closely to him, I follow him, I observe every micro action of his. That's how I know what I know. And then I only retire in the night when his door shuts. When the door of Muhammad shuts, that's when Abu Huraira takes retirement for the night. My dear respect to brothers and sisters, this is actually not even about Abu Huraira. Actually, I want to shift the focus to one particular man that many of us may have heard of, many of us may have not heard of. It's actually, does anybody know about how Abu Huraira became a Muslim? Anybody here? Show sure, of hands. Anybody know how the greatest muhaddir came into the fall of Islam? No? Ajeeb, honestly. We, inshallah, this is one thing hopefully we'll achieve by the end of the next 15 minutes. Is that today we're going to learn the name of the very man who is a means of hidayah for one of the greatest muhaddis for this, this ummah. Which we should be all indebted to because of this 5,800 plus hadith, ahadith, we are benefiting from the life of the teachings of the Sikh Yes? Yes? Yeah? Let me talk you through that, inshallah. The time of Rasulullah Sallallahu what happened? There were people like Abu Lahad, his uncle, his own blood uncle, spreading vicious rumors about this man named Muhammad. He's a sorcerer, he's a poet, he's a magician, he's a madman, what not, just keep away from him. And as you know, Mecca was a place of, you know, the merchants used to go there to perform the wife to the um, 360. I don't, I don't, 360, yeah, 365, whatever, more than one. Um, basically, a man by the name of Tufail. Tufail bin, Am, Tufail bin Amr al Dosi, he's from a tribe of Al Dos, which is in an area of Tihama near the Red Sea, actually falls into present day probably Yemen. Tufail ibn Amr, radiallahu anhu, he traveled, and he's one of the greatest poets of that time. He's very good at his poetry, he's, he's like the standard. Buna Muhammad, yeah, okay? So he basically traveled to uh, Mecca. The minute he arrived into Haram, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, all the leaders of the Quraysh, they saw him, they got him, they gave him such a splendid hospitality. A grand house, laid on everything that he could, you know, tickle his fancy. And basically they said to him at the end of this, this tower that, um, Keep away, there's a man amongst us, his name is Muhammad, he's a sorcerer, he's a madman, he's got this vicious lies that are beyond your imagination, keep away from it. And they did this regularly with people who were visitors. But, there's a lesson coming here for us 1400 years later. And Abu uh, Tufail ibn Amr, he heard this and he thought, right, I made an intention, I'm going to keep away from this man because my friends here have told me to keep away from this dangerous, dangerous man. Nonetheless, when he went to perform the Tawaf the very next day into the Harab, he saw that man that they said keep away from performing uh, praying. Praying Salah. 
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it wasn't in the form that we pray today because the commandment for salah had not been revealed. This is a very early day uh, uh, of, uh, of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Zabuah. Respected brothers and sisters, basically, in a long story short, what happened? To fail, saw this, and he was curious. He had a sifat, he had a quality in him which he never let people make a decision for him. He used his upper, his intelligence. He was the thinker. He never let other people think for him. But he said, let me think for myself. So after he performed this Dawah of 360 idols at the time of the Mushrik, he then saw the man that he was warned about, very humble in his prayer, in his worship, and he could hear bits of the Qur'an. He could hear the snippets of the Qur'an being played in such a beautiful, malignant voice of Rasulullah and how much would we love to hear that. And he listened to this and he said, hold on. In fact, to the extent he had cotton, he had put cotton into his ears that he didn't want the vicious rumors that he had been warned about to come into him so that he goes into a state of disbelief, into a state of intoxication. So he followed, once Rasulullah finished, he followed Rasulullah to his house, intrigued about the words that he had heard. And he asked himself, he reminded himself, all to fail. You're a poet, and you know that the words coming out of this man cannot be poetry. This is no man's words. This is something supernatural. So he followed him, and he followed him into his house, and there he told Rasulullah that, oh Muhammad, I am to fail from a tribe called those which is so far away, I come here and poet. People, your very people have warned me against you. And your very people have something against you. And what is it that it is? So Rasulullah gave him da'wah on Islam, and then he also recited a bit more of the Quran. Do you know which verse he recited? He recited Surah Allah. Qul a'udhu bi nas. And he recited this to him. And if you know the translation, it talks about that this is no sorcery, this is no, you know, the, the curse and, and so forth. This is very, very important. Cool. So just recited this verse, uh, a few verses. To fail the Amal of those things, no, 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 no sort of surprise, he became a Muslim. He took shahad and said, you know what, I can differentiate your words there, that they're the words of somebody who's supernatural, your Allah, my Allah, and these are the words of them. He became a Muslim. Then Rasulullah said to him, go back to your tribe. So he made intention straight away of accepting Islam, but I'm going to go back to my tribe, I'm going to invite them towards good. So he set off. And in one of the narrations it comes that he actually went there for a week and a half, he gave that out to his people, and basically no one accepted. He got jeered at, he got shunned. In fact his family probably accepted, but nobody else. And it's in the narration that he comes back to Rasulullah and he says, Ya Rasulullah, they choose adultery and they choose riba, interest, but they will not accept your deen. Please curse them because they've insulted me. Now, to the utter amazement of the Sahaba, the living companions who have narrated this in, in, in the hadith, that Rasulullah raised his hands, what do you think you and I would have done? We would have cursed these people outright for the, the mistreatment that they gave to us. But instead, Rasulullah raised his hand with full conviction to his Lord. He said, Ya Rasul, Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, guide these people, guide these people through his message. And then he gave him a very important, important, important piece of parting advice. Or to fail go back to your people. But this time, work on those very people, choose your people very carefully and go to the people with the best of life. Not the ones who are stubborn, but go to the people with the best of life. Stop there and you will, you will you will find success. This was the time of Makkah. The Prophet also did Hijrah seven years into the Hijrah. Rasulullah in the seventh year of Hijrah was in the Battle of Khaybar. And the Arabs in Medina saw a tribe come. In the tribe was 80 families, 80 caravans of the East Coast. 80 caravans of families coming. When they approached near, the Sahaba recognized the Berman and of those and his people. And after Rasulullah had returned from Khaybar, the battle, the Prophet he listened to what the Prophet had to say. How is it, mashallah, 80 families of yours have turned Muslim and come with you to join the Muslim in Madinah? This is to what the Prophet said. The Prophet Ya Rasulullah, I took your advice. I went back. Your dua was accepted. 
I started on your nasiha. Your advice to me was to go and start with the best of the people amongst my community. There was a man who was the first to accept. His name is Abu Hurairah. Subhanallah. Abu Hurairah was the first person to accept from the Dawah of Kufail, Ibn Amr al Dawsi. And there's a lesson in this, many, many lessons which I don't have the luxury of time. But in short, Muslims, British Muslims, Lancastrians, whatever you want to call yourselves, living here on campus in a village tucked away in the north, what do we draw from this? Seriously, what do we draw from this? There are vicious rumors spread about Muslims today. You need to turn your TV on, pick up the paper, flip it through, right? The person sitting next to you in the lectures is thinking something. Sister with a hijab, a brother with a kufi, a brother with a thaw, sister with a abaya, right? Um, in Jilbaya, a brother with a beard. What's that going to spell? Whatever we fed through through the education system here, through the media, it's going to trickle the stereotype. So, but stay steadfast and remain patient and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be the ambassador that you want to see. Be the change that you want to see. This is what Mahatma Gandhi was talking about in the world. Be the change that you want to see. That's the change that's going to come with you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al Ad, He says that very change will not come until you change that within yourself. Your exterior will not change until you change that within yourself. Imam Abu Hanifa, he says something very nicely here. He said, if the kings and the rulers were to know what was in the hearts of the believers, they would send their horses and cavalry to snatch it from you. He was referring to Iman. The wealth of Iman and the barakah that comes with it, Wallahi, my dear respected brothers and sisters, there's no price point. So you're second on campus, every second on campus, it's a means, it's an opportunity time for you to gain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like the people before us. Aspire for this change. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you with inspiration. Allah will bless you with inspiration will take you into the next world. My due respect to brothers and sisters, right? What lessons can we learn from that? That today on campus we are under the microscope, microscope of suspicion. Yeah. That's not our fault. But we're under it. Wallahi, let me tell you from working within the Muslim community at first Sentinel and in Madawa rounds, right? It's no better time to be a British Muslim today. It's no better time to be a Muslim da'i or da'iya living in the West. People are thirsty outside. People are dying for Iman. That brother there, Ali, was telling me that this is the second, third, fourth, what is it, the highest place for suicide. I've just been having a chat before the, the talk of suicide, right? Seriously, people willing to end their life. Why? Because there's no conviction that there's a test, there's an accountability for Africa. There's no sakinya, there's no tranquility in this life. The options are run out, and therefore it's easy to take a life. My dear respected brothers and sisters, we are the means for Hidayah, just like the failed in Amr al Dawsi was the means for Abu Huraira radiallahu anh and those 80 families. Just imagine now the reward that each and every one of us. You know, Abu Huraira, let me give you two hadith of him, right? Number one, he said, if you to, he was talking about charity in Sahih. I have got this highly Muslim, I don't want to say which one, it's the Sahih. He was talking about pick up between charity, between uh, different forms of charity. He narrated in one of the, the forms of charity, he said, Ya Rasulullah, even if a man was to pick up a morsel of food and put it into his wife's mouth, that's charity. Rasulullah this is also a form of salah. Now, if I go on today and say, okay, um, sweetheart, come over here. And it's not a piece of bread and I just give her in her mouth. Who's getting the reward? Abu Hurairah, I'm going to get the reward. My wife's going to get the reward for accepting Sadaqah. I'm going to get the reward for giving Sadaqah. And all those people who were behind my practice, yani right from Abu Hurairah, will get the reward. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, guarantee that anybody who shares in the, in, in the actions will benefit from the reward. And you know who narrated that hadith as well? Whosoever shares in the good reward, good actions of anybody is also rewarded. Do you know who narrated that? Abu Hurairah. This is a Sahih Muslim hadith from Abu Hurairah that if you encourage another person to do an act of goodness, then you also share in that reward. Now just think, to fail Ibn Amr al Dosi. Once he brought Abu Huraira into the fall of Islam through his dawah, he could have slept for the entire span of his life. He would be accused.
Because this is the inspiration, and this is the aspiration that we need to adhere to on campus. I don't want you to think that you're here just for the sake of a degree which is going to merely last you, at the very maximum, 60 years of your lifestyle on this thing. And there's no guarantee. Look at the number of doctors that are still sitting around waiting for a job despite the seven years of MBBS. Right? I know very, very number of people who, uh, a lot of number of people who are still job hunting when I graduated eight years ago. Seriously, no word of the money. But your job, your time on campus, it can be a means of hidayah for so many people, Muslim and non-Muslim alike. And I want to end it, inshallah, here um, on, on words of Imam Ghazali. You guys on campus, inshallah, I make the one tonight, starting now, inshallah that your years on campus, whether you're a freshie, whether you're a goldie oldie, it doesn't matter, you're a veteran, inshallah in your minutes on campus, you are the ambassador of Rasulullah You are the da'i and you are the da'iya of Rasulullah You are the ambassadors. If the people have got problems with Islam, don't blame them. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, what have I done today to change this misconception? What have I done to strengthen this? Take stock of yourself at night. On that point, before I go on to uh, the point of Imam Ghazali finishing off, I just want to I miss something very, very um, uh, about Abu Huraira. <coughs> Abu Huraira would spend his night in three portions. Actually, he would split the night up into three portions. First night, he would stand for prayer. Ibadah, Zikr, and Dilawa al Quran. Then he would take rest from his body. He would wake his wife. He then would encourage his wife to do the same and then he would let the wife rest and then he had a daughter. He would ask the daughter to rise and she would spend the night in supplication. The entire house of Abu Huraira was spent in the supplication of the Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly blessed Abu Huraira with Ilham. And the barakah that came with that, I don't have the time to go into the story of the milk of the, the Ahlaya Sufa, what happened, how 70 people drank from one vessel, this basically, from a cup. And how Abu Huraira used to recite Istighfar 12,000 times in the day, 12,000 times in the night. Seriously, brothers and sisters, it's beyond that imagination, but pray for this ilham, and wallahi, I pray that Allah SWT blesses you in your youth with this ilham, and you will become like not for only people in the West, but people in the East. On that point of Imam Ghazali, my parting advice to you as your brother in Islam, that you are very passionate to revive the, you're very passionate to revive the, the, the you know, so you're very passionate to revive you know, this Ummah, whether it be on campus, whether it be outside campus in Lancaster, whether it be in the entire West. Alhamdulillah, Allah SWT reward us for that passion. Amen. But we've got to understand how Hidayah works. How does guidance from Allah SWT work? And in short, Imam Ghazali gives the example of two farmers. Okay? He gives the example of two farmers. One, he says there's a farmer who throws his seed and then puts his feet up. He basically doesn't do anything. He just throws his seed and says, Tawakkal Allah, like I did. Right? And there's another farmer who not only makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he then goes and makes the effort in the field. So he throws the seed, he waters it, he maintains maintenance and all so forth that goes with it. And the question then me and you would ask is, well obviously the, 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 the farmer that who basically uh, makes the effort and he makes the one to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the second one, I mean, is in a stronger position. And the question that you and I would ask is, who has a one, who, who will get more, right? This is the question we would ask from the two farmers. One doesn't make an effort, he just either makes the one and doesn't make, uh, you know, uh, sow the seed, or he just throws the seed, doesn't make the effort, and doesn't make the one. That's farmer one. Farmer two is the example where he makes the one first and then he goes and sows the seed. And then he maintains the so khidmah that goes with it. And then, obviously, me and you will look at that to say, well, obviously, farmer two is going to receive the most. Right? So, anybody disagree with me? No. Okay. Imam Ghazali, rahimullah, amazing hakim, wisdom. This is excellence of wisdom. Allah. He said the question should not be who received more. This is not the question. 
Because the question that I ask is from the two, from the two, who has the haq to ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is the question that should be asked. Who has the right to ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his infin infinite mercy, out of his infinite treasures? Who has the right? It's not about who receives the most. It's who has the right to expectation. Yes, who has the right to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and expect from him? The one who doesn't ask him has no right to ask from him. Expect from him. The one who asks from him and then makes the sunnah, the sunnah is to make the effort. So in the seed. He has completed this kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. He has yaqeen in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is Allah who will give me the crops and the produce, but then he goes and does the sunnah as well. And the sunnah is that he goes and sows the seed. My dear respected brothers, in this lesson, in this, if you can get this into our heads, in this short 25 minutes, then wallahi we will take a lot more with us today, that if you take the life of Abu Huraira and Tufayr bin Amr al dawsi and the virtue that was, you know, just from the mere words of Dawah, that's what you guys are going to encompass, whether it's to Muslims or whether it's to non-Muslims. Spend your time wisely, and I will give you one tip of secret that I learned from Shayyukhs, is that the effort of the night, and it's what Abu Huraira is doing, the proof of concept, Abu Huraira was doing this. The effort of the night is 90%, and the effort of the day is 10%. Effort of the night is 90%, effort of the day is 10%. What does that mean? The Sahabas, why were they successful in this life? Why did they get glad to have the Raja Allah? I am pleased with you, and you are pleased with me. Why did they get this in their living period? Because they spent their nights on the Musalla and they spent their days on the hopes. They spent their nights crying in front of their beloved, attaching their souls, their mind, their spirituality to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they spent the day in, in their errands, in striving, on their hosts, in the marketplaces, with the families. We now need to question ourselves where are our nights being spent and where are our days being spent. For those people who think they're very successful, you need to take an analogy of how much of the night is 90% has been spent in, in devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how much of the day has been spent. It's probably, if you're like me, then it's probably the other way around. 90% spent in the day, 10% in the night, and then I wonder why I came out with the right Okay. So inshallah, on, on that note, I would just like to say, it's just a reminder uh, for all of us inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah bless you in your time on campus. Bless you in your time off campus. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take, take great work from you in your limited time here. Spend it wisely. And inshallah ta'ala, I don't have the time to go into what First Ethical is doing, but that's not the purpose tonight. Uh, no doubt inshallah ta'ala you will see more of us on campus in the seminars that we deliver and, and uh, some of the campaigns that we're running. Check our website out inshallah. It's www.firstethical1stethical.com and um, inshallah a bit more about what we do. On that note, I'd just like to leave the, the dua that uh, these words which are the benefit for you and I today. And on your Mokiyama, where it really matters, they don't work against me. Just like you are a person, I don't know what inspired speech and I pray that we can embody this. Uh, one of the ways we can embody this is through charity, which is coming up in a few weeks' time.